Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. The title of this episode is Effective Communication Skills for Littles. In this episode, we are speaking with Brianna, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, an infant family early childhood mental health specialist, and a perinatal mental health specialist certified. Since 2011, Brianna has worked exclusively with families with very young children to navigate challenges related to child development, ADHD, behavioral and emotional issues, attachment problems, and trauma. Guided by attachment theory and the neuro-relational framework, her approach is unique in that she works primarily with parents by helping them discover their child's nervous system and developmental needs. In this process, parents also learned about their nervous system and the ways it supports and sometimes conflicts with their children. She also guides parents to develop vital skills in self-reflection and deconstructing family cycles of guilt and shame, which aims to drastically shift the child-parent relational patterns. Brianna also works with new moms experiencing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. She uses a conscious and mindfulness-informed approach to help moms realign their expectations with reality deconstruction and guilt and shame they're experiencing and shift it into present moment where depression and anxiety cannot exist. Brianna, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast again. It's such an honor to have you on and a treat for my audience. Can you give a little bit about your background for the people for the first time hearing you? Sure. I run an Instagram page called Conscious Mommy. I'm also on TikTok now where I like to share helpful information for families with children really of any age on how to connect in a deeper way. I like to teach parents how to become the conscious parent that they never had. I really believe that the relationships that we have with our children um, set the stage for our children's future success. Um, And so my main mission is to really change the world one child parent relationship at a time. And I know today we're talking about um, helping our children with their communication skills, which really, you know, begins with us. It begins with how we are communicating with our children. So are we communicating with our children in a way that is aligned with their development Or do we have expectations for our children that are just beyond what our children are developmentally capable of? Now, you don't need to be like a child psychologist. You don't need to like have a master's degree in any of this. this. The framework is really very simple. If a child could do, they would do. Mm -hmm. So if we're, for example, asking our child to put away their clothes, and our child is having a meltdown or is unable to do it or says no or run away or they become very frustrated, our immediate inclination is to think, well, I've been showing you how to do this a thousand times or I've been teaching you how to do this. You obviously are just being a defiant, willful child. We automatically go into this state of ego. Mm -hmm. We believe that it is about the child wanting to defy us. Because we have it in our minds that that's what children are about. That is not what children are about. And it's because we have these, this mindset, this conditioned mindset, actually, that it forces us to see the child as something they are not. And then it shifts how we communicate with them. If I see my child as a spoiled, little, entitled brat who is going to constantly be pushing up against me just to test me and just to test my limits, that is going to deeply impact how I react to my child in that moment. I'm probably going to get frustrated and I'm going to not have patience and I'm going to be a bit more aggressive with my tone or maybe I'll even get punitive. Well, fine. If you can't figure this out, then I guess you don't get any TV tonight, right? I even become arbitrary in how I'm trying to control this child instead of really like, gosh, this seems like it's really tough for you. You know, I've noticed that I've been really trying to teach you how to put away your, put away your clothes. And yet I see it's just really not happening for you today, honey. Tell me what's going on in your body. Help me understand what the issue is for you. 
Mm-hmm. Now, when I come to my child with this connected, curious stance, I, there's nothing for my kid to resist within me. Now I'm not coming at them with a fight. I'm coming at them with, teach me about you. And this is, the, this is really the basis for healthy communication. It is curiosity. It is a deep sense of, I want to understand you better. Yeah. And when we as parents can shift away from, I need to control you and you need to comply with me too. Boy, do I just want to understand you a little bit better. The child then internalizes that as, oh, I'm worthy of being understood. And my parent is teaching me how to communicate my needs more effectively. Clearly, it's not effective for me to just say no or stamp my feet or run around and look kind of all dysregulated and and disorganized. My parent actually understands me better when I say, you know, I had a really hard day at school today. Mm -hmm. The kids are making fun of of me. They were making fun of how I was dressed. They made fun of my hair. They made fun of my backpack. So I really don't want to put these clothes away because I don't even think I want to wear these clothes anymore. I feel bad when I wear these clothes. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to get that if I don't approach my child with curiosity. Exactly. You see what I mean? Yeah, no, I like that approach. Um, Coming to the point with curiosity. What if like your child has a little bit of hard time communicating what they feel emotionally? Mm -hmm. Um, How can we work through with that um, to help kind of understand them if they're having a hard time verbally communicating what they feel? Brilliant. Excellent question. So um, children need parents to be emotional coaches for them, meaning it's not part of our human nature to be able to articulate with poise exactly what it is that we're feeling on the inside. Feelings are really meant to be felt and they're a visceral experience. And we we display them with our body through our tears, through our teeth, right? We That's how we show the feelings in our bodies. So it's actually a social skill mm-hmm. to learn how to say what it is that you're feeling and to process and talk about it in a contained way. Children are not able to do that, first of all, without parents who know how to do it. And second of all, without parents who don't know how to teach the child to do that. So if a child is struggling to express their emotions, first things first, notice how you express your own emotions. When you get frustrated, when you're sitting at the, at the red light and then somebody comes and speeds up and cuts you off, how do you react? Yeah. Do you flip out? Do you have road rage? Is it instant? Because your child's watching. Yeah. What's going on for you? When, when, you know, something happens, uh, you know, with a, with a sibling, with your, with your sister or your brother. Let's say they say something to you that really ticks you off. How do you respond? Do you shut down? Do you ignore them? Do you go way too hard on your boundaries and get aggressive, kick them out, not talk to them again? What do you do? How do you express your feelings? First and foremost, most important thing for parents to evaluate and for parents to assess in themselves and for them to start shifting. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is then teaching the child about their emotions. A really great statement that I tell parents to say to a child is, you know, whoa, you're feeling really strongly, right? We can really never get it wrong when we say that. Yeah. We might get it wrong if we say you're feeling angry, you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling scared. We might get it wrong. And don't be afraid to get it wrong. It's really okay to get it wrong. It's not about getting it right. It's about communicating to the child. I see something big is going on inside of you. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I like to say to a child, "Whoa, you're feeling really strongly so that the child can identify, oh, when I have this going on in my body, this is something big and strong in the adults in my life. Stop and notice and help me figure out what's going on inside. And then maybe I use my presence and my time and my affection just to get down to my child's eye level and say, whatever it is that's going on inside of you, I'm here with you. And I can say that without words, right? That can Mm -hmm. simply be communicated through my body language. Like a hug. Of course, with a hug. And then afterward, you know, especially for like non-speaking kids, so, or not yet speaking kids, maybe. So toddlers, you know, who haven't quite figured it out yet. I really am a big fan of reading books about, about different kinds of feelings. So, you know, you've got like your general book the way I feel and um, the, you know, inside my heart. So you've got some general books about all different kinds of feelings that are very good for little children. 
Um, but then you've got books about like having really big, strong feelings. Like sometimes I'm Bombaloo, when Marvin gets mad, the chocolate covered cookie tantrum. Or all of these books are really great books to teach children about what's happening inside of them. And sometimes when a child sees it playing out on a page, mm-hmm. that helps them connect more in the same way that like when you see parts of your life playing out in a movie, you don't necessarily have to directly address parts of your life, but there's a healing because you see it and you see how others might be dealing with it in the movie. So -hmm. these are all good, good ways to kind of create an environment in the home that is emotionally secure and emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Hey friends, I hope you are enjoying this week's episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. This podcast would not be possible if it wasn't for the support of you, my wonderful community. To support your mama's podcast, please click the support link right down below and you can donate just as little as 99 cents. Also, follow me in the Shop Like to Know It app where you can follow me with all my exclusive content all the way from baby products I love, fashion and style and everything in between. Now let's get back to the episode. So what if, um, how can parents navigate um, any other different type of communication techniques with like behavioral and emotional issues that you know are like present and known? Um, Is there anything that they should do differently when communicating? Yeah. So I would suggest that when we're communicating to really check our body language Mm -hmm. as well as our tone. Um, so much of the times, like when we are, especially when we're frustrated, when we're triggered, our body language sends the wrong message. We hover over the child or we get a really intense look on our face or our bodies kind of splay outwards. And we look very anxious and very nervous. Mm -hmm. All of these send a confusing message to the child. And the primary message that the child receives is this moment isn't safe. Yeah, And our children are not going to be able to really learn about their emotions and they certainly will not be able to communicate well if they're not feeling safe. So our primary job is to be aware of what's going on in our bodies so that we can at least create a couple moments of physical safety. So one of my best tips of advice for parents is to get down to the child's eye level at or below it and to communicate in a way that is very slow. We want to talk low Mm -hmm. and we really want to talk very little in these kinds of moments. Say, say the the less you say, the more you say. Yeah. And these are going to be how we kind of deactivate a child in a stressful moment and really even deactivate ourselves so that we can have more effective communication. I also want parents to be aware of, you know, any empty threats that they may be saying. If you feel like you're, if you don't, do X, Y, Z, then this is going to be the consequence or this is going to be the punishment. That's certainly not going to set up a collaborative environment where, where we're setting the stage for working together. Yeah. I really want to encourage parents to see their children as partners, really as, as, as equal human beings with just different skill sets. Mm -hmm. They, they're not as skilled as us as adults because their brains aren't fully developed. Exactly. They're not, they're not as physically capable as adults. But they can't drive a car. You know what I mean? They can't work a job. Okay. But that doesn't make them inferior beings. And, and when we see them as, as equal, whole human beings who are worthy of the same respect and the same um, adoration that you would give to any stranger that you might pass. Mm -hmm. I think this really sets the tone for a collaborative, dare I even say cooperative environment where it's, it's a little lighter and it's a little easier because the the main focus is how can we work on this together? Yeah. It's not about you doing what I say simply because I'm telling you to do it, but it's about me noticing, gosh, you really don't want to get in the bath today, honey. I wonder what the issue is. Tell me more about it. I'm telling you it's bath time, but you're telling me you don't want to take a bath. I see a lot of dirt and grime underneath your, your fingernails, your hair, very sweaty from playing, but you really don't want to get in. So help me understand what the issue is for you. And, and, you know, I find that when we meet our children in this way, not only do they eventually get into the bath, they do, but we also 
we also learn that children just want to be heard. They just want to under, they just want us to understand what's going on for them. You know, I had this conversation recently with my child and, and his response was, well, I'm working really hard on this. And if I get into the bath right now, then Giovanni might come and break, break apart my train that I've spent so long building. Wow. Oh, I see. So, so from the parent's perspective, right. I'm thinking, gosh, so he does not, he doesn't know how to protect his work. Yeah. Right. That's the skill here. He does. He's, he physically does not have the physical skills to take this train that he's been working on and put it up high so that his toddler, you know, impulsive little brother doesn't come and knock it over. So I recognize the skill that's missing for him, which is some problem solving and also just physical, you know, body related skills. And then I'm like, well, you know, I think there might be a solution to that. Yeah, you can I'm- help them move it up, you know, up high. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, I got you, son. I'll make oh, sure that, you know, Giovanni doesn't knock it over or or whatever. And I noticed when I talk like that with my son and I get curious and help him with, with what he can't do, he's so much more cooperative. Yes. And well, exactly. yeah, think about and- it like this. Like if you go to work and you have a boss who is over overbearing, demanding, you do as I say, because I said so, no question, no exceptions. I don't care what you think. That's going to be an environment that you probably won't survive for very long in. Or thrive. You, yeah, you're certainly not going to thrive, but it's going to be hard to survive in that environment. Mm-hmm. It will feel toxic. You will see tons of turnover. You will see people being miserable. A really good working environment is one where everybody, including the person in charge, is uh, where all of their voices are heard and respected and understood. And sure, we may not always be able to honor every single person's idea, but at least their idea is welcome on the table. Yeah. And heard and, and, you know, validated and, you know, looked at as like a possibility as an option um, if they suggested something. So, so what, right. So what can you help parents identify like their triggers? Like what is something that, You can let the audience know about something that's triggering them and how to change the outcome of the trigger. Yes. Well, I, first of all, I have an entire workshop that's like two hours long on triggers. So I'm going to just give the the bullet points here, but if people need more, they can go check out the workshop. So when it comes to our triggers, what's really important to know is Many of the things that our children trigger within us are really reflections of things that have not yet been healed within us. Mm -hmm. So I had a mother yesterday in one of my groups say that she's really triggered by her child's yelling. And she said, I tell him, it's not okay. You cannot yell at me. Her child's two and a half. She's triggered. It's not that this child has an issue with yelling. The child is two and a half. Two and a half year olds yell and they don't know how to control the, their, their tone of voice. And, and the fact that she was perceiving it, this child is yelling at me. That is what told me she's triggered. She is immediately being catapulted into her past, remembering her experiences as a child, feeling yelled at, rejected, dismissed by her own mother in these aggressive attacking kind of ways. And so she's receiving her child's developmentally normal and typical behavior Mm -hmm. as as if it is something personal, as if it is about her. And here is how she's acting out the trigger. She's trying to get the yelling to stop. She's doing everything she can to get the yelling to stop. Not because that's what's necessarily better for the child, but because she could not get her own mother's yelling to stop. Mm-hmm. And so now she wants to get this child's yelling to stop because she can't escape the ch- child in the same way that she was able to eventually escape her mother. Yeah. So when it comes to triggers, it's often just patterns being repeated over and over and over and over again. And until we really start to face the patterns and shift the narrative, my child is not yelling at me. My child is yelling because he's two and a half. He does not know how to control his voice. Mm-hmm. I am reacting as if this is a punishment, but I'm a good mom. There's no punishment here. Yeah. So I like to take parents through an exercise. This, the yelling is triggering for me because, and then we keep breaking it down until we get to the core belief 
And we have four main core beliefs, um, you know, or primary. I should, it's not just four, but it's many. I'm not enough. I'm a bad kid. Nobody cares about me. I'm not lovable if I'm not perfect, etc. There's so many core beliefs around essentially not being enough, not being worthy or being bad that we can boil our triggers down to. And then from there, we reconstruct a new narrative around the triggers so that we can show up to these kinds of situations in a more healed and whole way. Mm -hmm. And I think the most healed and whole way that we show up to these situations is one, being aware, whoa, it's a triggering situation for me. And then also being aware of what the child might actually be trying to communicate or what the other person might actually be trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. So another thing I always tell parents is being triggered is not the problem. It's what we do with our triggers. Exactly. Am I making my triggers my child's problem? Now, if you had parents who were emotionally immature, most likely the ways they were triggered became your problem. Yeah. So if your parents were hitting you, yelling at you, spanking you, punishing you, you know, denying you food and doing all kinds of other ridiculous and harmful things, it was because they were triggered. It wasn't because they were parenting effectively. It was because they they were mad and angry because they were triggered 100 percent. Most of the times when we react in that way, it's because we're feeling triggered. I totally (laughs) agree. And, I, you know, I I'm guilty of that sometimes, you know, I'm definitely not perfect. And I try to take a step back. And if I've been a little too harsh, I always just try to make sure that I apologize Mm -hmm. to my child. Like, hey, you know, I'm sorry if I was a little harsh. I was feeling a little frustrated because of this. And, you know, I'm your best friend and I'm here for you and I'll be better. And I'm sorry. Like, I always try to apologize if I was a little too harsh because I know after I take a step back, it's because of me. It's not the child. It's totally my triggers and my frustrations on whatever is going on with me. I had a similar moment where I, I had said, I I did a threat. I said, okay, well, you know, I'm going in for lunch and you know, if you don't come in for lunch, honey, then I guess you just won't eat any lunch today. And my son is very, very sensitive. Now, this is a very minor threat. It wasn't like I was saying, I'm going to restrict your food. I was simply letting him know, hey, you're in charge of your body. If you don't come for lunch, then, you know, your tummy's going to be hungry. Now, my child's very sensitive and he did not like that. He actually ran away, um, went to the back of the house for 45 minutes until I finally came up to him. And I said, Mateo, I think we need to talk about how I behaved and what I said. Mm-hmm. I think I really hurt you when I said that. And I, and I think it really hurt your feelings. I'm very sorry for having hurt you in that way. And he always gets this like look on his face that like, that's this like sinking heart look, oh. I guess I'll describe it as. Yeah. And he put his arms up and he said, don't you know, mommy, that all I really needed was just a hug. Oh yeah. Right. And then, you know, I, I didn't know that that was what he needed. And that's why he wasn't coming in for lunch, that all he wanted was a hug to be able to transition from riding his motorcycle, he says, and then coming in to eat. All he needed was a hug to be able to make that happen. He didn't need my my boundary to be so firmly stated like I thought he needed. Yeah, He just needed a hug. And, you know, he's four. So one, he's a little bit more capable to communicate this way, but also two, we have really created an environment where these things are openly discussed and allowed to be discussed and nurtured. So this voice within him is very much encouraged in the home. And so, you know, I let parents know, no matter where you are on your journey, go ahead. You're in charge of the ship. You can steer it in any direction that you want. I don't care how old your children are. You can start making these shifts now, if you've been in some kind of habit habit or pattern for a period of time, your kids might resist your efforts at first. That's okay. Keep going. It doesn't mean that it's you're ineffective in any way. It just simply means it's going to take a little bit more time to rewire and reconfigure mm-hmm. how we can connect and relate together. But you'll eventually get there and it'll feel so much better and you'll feel so much more effective if you can do that. Yeah. And it's such a great, like rewarding feeling to go through that, you know, the troubled times, the triumph, you know, it's, um, 
I just love your philosophy. And it's always a great reminder, even for me on how I am with like my own children. And um, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. If you guys want to check out Brianna, all of her links are down below in the show notes. Please reach out. I think it is, she is definitely worth giving a try. I think every parent should work from a conscious point. And don't forget to check out my previous episode with Brianna, episode number 17, where we discuss conscious parenting. And I hope to see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Not Your Mama's Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you in the next one.